Welcome to this presentation focused on eating during the holidays with IBD, hosted by the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation in collaboration with Nutritional Therapy for IBD. We are pleased to partner to offer helpful tips and education to those living with IBD. The Crohn's and Colitis Foundation's IBD Help Center can offer support and information if you have any questions about Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis by calling 1-888-MY-GUT-PAIN or emailing info at Crohn'sColitisFoundation.org. You can also access information about diet and nutrition, gut-friendly recipes, and more on our website as seen here on the screen. Nutritional Therapy for IBD also offers educational resources and recipes for both clinicians and people living with IBD. To learn more, visit their website at nutritionaltherapyforibd.org. I'm Catherine Soto, Associate Vice President of Patient Education and Support at the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, and I'm very pleased to moderate this discussion. Here to discuss this topic today are two very special guests. I'm excited to be joined today by Dr. Madison Simons, psychologist for the Department of Gastroenterology at the Cleveland Clinic. I'm also happy to introduce to you Raman Prasad, a patient with IBD who will be sharing his patient perspective with us today. Thank you both for joining. Thanks so much for inviting me. Uh, thank you, Kat, for inviting me too. Well, before we get started on this great conversation, let's just go over a few quick pieces of information. The information provided during this presentation is meant for educational purposes only. It should not replace any advice you receive from your gastroenterologist or a primary care physician. If you have any questions about your specific care, please reach out to your healthcare team. Again, if you have questions that are specific to inflammatory bowel disease, you can contact our IBD Health Center by calling one 888 my good pain or emailing info at Crohn's Colitis Foundation.org. So with that, let's jump in. Dr. Simons, I'm going to pose this question for you as our first question. And it is with the holiday season time upon us, why is it important for us to discuss IBD diet and our mental health? I think the holidays bring together a lot of variables that people with IBD are thinking about all of the time, and it brings them together in perhaps the most stressful of ways. They're navigating new eating experiences. They're navigating relationships with other people. They're navigating joining in activities that they may have felt afraid of participating in through the whole year, and now you're doing all of these things at the same time. Um, and you might be adding in travel around that experience. And so Together, this can reflect a very stressful series of months for patients managing not only IBD, but also other digestive conditions. Thank you. I think that's very true um, for many people, but in particular for IBD patients, it can be a, a very stressful time. So, um, Raman, let me turn over to you and let's talk about um, your experience. Tell us about yourself and your disease journey. And specifically, I'm curious to know if eating around the holidays or any time within a social setting has been a challenge that you've learned to overcome. Uh, oh, thanks again, Kat, for inviting me. Um, I, I was diagnosed with IBD many years ago toward the end of high school. I struggled quite a bit in the first six or seven years with controlling symptoms, including you know, being on uh, quite a few steroids, hospital stays. And I think worst of all, just not knowing how I would feel from day to day. A lot of time has passed since then, and I've been able to use uh, integrated care, including some dietary changes to manage my health and have a full life. Um, recently, in thinking about other people's living, other people living with chronic disease, I've been pursuing a part-time master's degree in social work, which has included working with nutritional therapy for IBD. And with the holidays coming, you know, as Madison was saying, it's an important part of coming together with family and friends but also, you know, brings up some challenges. So some of the challenges I'll talk about are drawn from my personal experience, but also in just talking with many other, you know, now, now friends and people over the years who have, you know, who also have Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And I want to talk about unwanted attention to start us off here. Um, I know patients may feel as they uh, may have attention drawn to them 
as they make food choices. And mm -hmm. I'm curious, Raman, if you could tell us what that looks like and any ways you've handled this. Oh, sure. You know, especially when I wasn't feeling well um, or early, early on, you know, we'd have these big Thanksgivings, at, you know, with at least a dozen, dozen dishes being passed around. What you'd expect, you know, turkey, gravy, mashed potatoes, a lot of vegetable dishes, and even, you know, one, one relative's famous stuffing. So in general, there were some uh, foods I would pass on. I, I wanted to just, you know, when the dishes were coming around, I wanted to pass on them because they wouldn't always agree with me. But this also would bring extra attention depending on the dish and who's and who made it. And so I was thinking about some of the the, the comments that kind of um, that, that happened when I was at, when I was you know passing on dishes. Some would be a bit overprotective, you know, like everyone, you know, make sure he doesn't get any of you know dish X. Like, you know, let's let's keep him okay. Or you know, maybe there'd be like a hint of pressure. I remember like one older relative saying, you know, just have a little piece of this. I'm, I'm sure you'll like it. You know, make your Make your godmother happy. I'm not trying to hurt you. Um, and then other things felt maybe a little bit more intrusive, like, oh, you know, hey, you don't you don't look that great. You know, why don't you try to get some more weight back on? Why are you eating? And, uh, you know, personally, I didn't want any of the attention. And I really wish I had a way to, to respond to those comments, you know, back then. You know, sometimes I would just put food on my plate or maybe nibble on something that um, wasn't great for me, you know, at the time. But um, yeah, I really appreciate, you know, Dr. Simons, you know, you know, helping give some advice on, you know, what, what, you know, what people could do in those situations. Yeah, um, Dr. Simons, what Raman shared is likely something we have heard from other patients as well. I'm sure there are patients nodding as they're hearing this. Uh, how do you, in, in hearing what Raman's story is involved and in, in his advice or what, how he handled it, um, how have you heard this be a common concern and, and what are some other ways patients should be navigating the unwanted attention in a group setting like this around food? I think Raman's experience is certainly not unique in navigating the social eating experiences with IBD. And as I think about this type of situation, what comes to mind at the forefront is really what are the patient's values in terms of what other people know about their condition, as well as how they're going to eat in that situation? Um, is it important to me that other people in my life know a little bit about what I'm going through or even a lot of what I'm going through? And so we can rehearse ahead of time, how much am I willing to disclose about my experience um, that may garner more questions or, or may help uh, address some of the attention that we're getting from other people. Some people feel more comfortable than others disclosing information about what they're going through, but providing some education to people. It could range from, I've been diagnosed with Crohn's disease or a digestive condition. That means that the foods that I eat can impact how I feel day to day, but it could go as far as the foods that I eat cause my bowels to change and make my stomach hurt. And maybe I disclose more about the types of symptoms that I have. But then when I think about the actual foods that I'm putting on my plate and how I'm going to navigate what I am eating in that situation, I'm going to think about what are my likely symptoms going to be. Raman, you had mentioned like, do I put the food on my plate and I eat it anyway? Well, maybe if I don't want to answer the questions, maybe I'm going to put the food there, but I practice what it looks like to not empty my plate at the time. Um, or I practice what it looks like to say no to someone who's passing a dish in front of me. Um, and I think we'll go through this over this next um, time together of I really want to be practicing these situations before I arrive at Thanksgiving dinner of what that looks like to sit with other people while they eat and say no or not clear my plate or to try a little bit of new food. Those are not things that I should be practicing for the first time when I show up to dinner. That's a very valid point. And I mean, we're starting with some of the the social challenges or the mentally how what toll that can take. But certainly, Raman, you've experienced physical challenges as well. Um, so if there are symptoms that you've experienced, eating meals or being in celebrations and gatherings with friends and family, uh, tell us about some of those symptoms. I know fatigue was one that you had privately shared um, uh, that you had struggled with. What about other symptoms, uh, pain and just other 
related symptoms in the GI tract that you're feeling in a moment that is kind of in that setting of just gathering and food. Yeah, that's great. And I really appreciate the idea of practice. I think just because of, you know, over time I've, I've had practice, but it would have been mm -hmm. nice to consciously think about that, you know, early on. Um, so, so fatigue was definitely one of the symptoms that I, I struggled to manage. And I wanted to share a note from a um, person, I won't, I won't give her name, in the early 20s with IBD now that captures, uh, I guess, also my feelings of fatigue and, and in her case, also um, pain. And, and so she, she wrote that, you know, my family prepares a large Thanksgiving meal together and spends time cleaning up afterward. It used to be a fun time for me with, you know, laughing and joking. But with Crohn's, I experienced a lot of fatigue. During past holidays, I'll really push myself to participate the whole time that it leaves me feeling burned out. Um, how can I explain the situation without coming across as, as lazy? And one of the problems is on the outside, I look, he I look healthy. And because of that, people don't believe me when I say I'm not feeling well. And then in addition to fatigue, um, she brought up that, you know, I often feel stomach pain, especially, especially after eating. And I can't last that long sitting without having to leave the table for a while and maybe even lie down. I don't want to appear like I'm skipping out on people or ungrateful, but if I force myself to stay, I'll, I'll just be bracing, hoping for the minutes to pass. And, and she, and I guess there's a question for Dr. Simons, you know, what, what can I do to sort of exit gracefully as well as communicate the fatigue, the fatigue being real and, and not being able to partic participate? Yeah, Dr. Simons, what are your specific tips? And you said practicing is important, but can you talk us through how you prepare for this? I think this is twofolded. One is just recognizing that this is going to be an energy expenditure that you're coming into. And so doing what you can on the front and back end to start to prepare for this, um, especially if you're traveling around this situation, that's also going to be an energy expenditure leading up to it. And so you're probably storing energy in your bank, preparing to go through this situation. On that day, you might choose some more intentional rest that morning um, or intentional rest the next day and spacing out your activities, recognizing that you have a finite level of resources. This is really true for all humans, regardless of whether they have a chronic condition or an autoimmune condition. But most humans don't have those built in guardrails that say you've done too much. Um, and you can help other people understand this of, you know, if there'd been times in your life where you've done a little too much one day and the next day you pay for that, you're more emotionally short, you feel like you need more rest. And that's the same thing that's happening in IBD, except your guardrails are going to come up a little sooner and your body's going to give you stronger warning signs that it needs a break away. Um, and so you can even bring other people in depending on your comfort level of these are my warning signs that I'm coming to the end of my resources. Um, and to protect my own self or to be able to continue in tomorrow's activities, it's going to be important for me to go home a little bit early tonight um, or to not take as much part in activities. And so again, reaching out into your social environment as much as you're comfortable um, and bringing them into the experiences that you're having um, ultimately is probably going to have a more rewarding experience for you than trying to manage it all on your own in isolation. Even if it's just one person at the gathering who knows what your warning signs are, um, that can feel like a safer place than doing it by yourself. And using the restroom, let's talk about that along these same thread. It, that can be something very obvious and, and uncomfortable for patients to manage. So how do how do we manage the emotions and the embarrassment or just the, the discomfort? It's easy for us to say, just go, you need to go. But how do you manage the emotions that come with having to do all that? There are, I mean, the just go side of it, it's not so easy for that, for a brain that feels very afraid of like the social humiliation that might come. And if we come back to that idea of practice, this might mean that we practice leading up to the event by going into a public toilet and practicing what it's like to fart loudly sitting next to someone 
or we might practice what it looks like to poop in somebody else's house. And we start with those people who feel super comfortable to us. Um, maybe we're going to travel with a little bit of room spray if that helps us feel more comfortable, or maybe we're going to run the water while we're going to the bathroom if that's going to help us also. Um, our tendency as humans is to start to avoid the things that make us feel uncomfortable. And even though in the moment that immediately relieves our distress to avoid the situation, over the long run, it reinforces to the brain that we don't have the ability to cope with that situation. And so my encouragement for people is to approach these situations rather than avoid them and help the brain gain that sense of confidence around, I could manage, okay, even if I need to stand up and go to the bathroom 20 times while I'm there tonight, that is something I can manage if it were to need to happen. And maybe it won't, but it also might. And I'm not going to avoid the possibility that that's something that could happen today. Raman, I, has this been something you would have struggled with and how have you addressed it? Yeah, for, first, I, I guess, you know, I was I was lucky in the times when my health wasn't under control and that I could go to another floor in the house if there was a feeling of urgency. But I know not everyone has that luxury. Um, and and someone, someone did share an experience that, that I talked to you know, prior to this meeting about being in remission now, but last holiday not being in remission and being in a, a small house, their, their grandmother's house is small and having to use the bathroom a dozen times. And, and that person will definitely appreciate the, the advice um, Madison just gave. And, and I think uh, depending on who hears this, you know, Ma Madison's advice about, you know, uh, <laughs> passing wind in a public restaurant, restaurant may become like a TikTok challenge. <laughs> we, we hope not, but let, let's see. But um, it, it's funny. Also, I, I, I do a kind of random though. I think back in the '80s in Japan, they they started selling the equivalent of white noise machines that you know would make the sound of running water for for people to use in, in bathrooms. You know, to to preserve modesty. I, I think something like that is probably available here now too. So. Ram and I also think about like you brought up being in a flare or not being in a flare at the holiday yeah. time, and I think sometimes we can put this expectation on ourselves that. We have to be present and do the holiday in the way that it's always been done in my family. Um, and maybe that's not a reality for me this year um, and this holiday if I'm in the middle of a flare. This is really going to be guided by what my values are. But even if my value is family connection, there are probably ways that I can approximate that value, even if it, even if I don't participate in the holiday the way that I always done it or that my family has always done it. And so a lot of times I'm doing work with people too on finding flexibility around the experience that maybe my family is willing to eat something totally different, something that's not a Thanksgiving meal, or, or maybe this year I'm just going to do it smaller. I'm going to do it with one or two loved ones because I'm in the middle of a flare and we're going to take a walk instead of eating a dinner together. Um, and so just like looking for those places where it doesn't have to look the way it always has. That's that's a great point. I and mean, just being flexible and being able to, like you said, like communicate that to people in the family you trust or to everyone, depending on the circumstance. And what about, um, you know, feelings of shame? I think, uh, Raman, you had shared that uh, this is can, can be something that people do is compare themselves to other people. Um, so how, Dr. Simons, how do we manage, how do we avoid doing that? Or what's the approach to addressing uh, comparisons and looking at someone that might be healthy or comparing to your own situation? And coming back to like, what is my, what is my brain feeling afraid of or feeling threatened in this situation and allowing space to feel those hard emotions of feeling deep shame about what I'm going through or feeling guilty is, is my brain telling me that this is something I've caused on myself. And sometimes it's taking this observer perspective of those negative emotions that we're having and just acknowledging, okay, brain, you are afraid that I'm not as, I'm not as um, achieved as the person next to me or 
there's something inherently wrong with me. Um, and, and I'm afraid that this means something negative about me, but giving space for that negative emotion rather than trying to make those thoughts go away often helps dull down the power of recognizing this is a thought that I'm having. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a fact. Absolutely. And also, how about cravings? Because I think uh, what I'm hearing is patients can tend to be restrictive um, because of sometimes it relates to the fear of uh, triggering a symptom or these experiences of embarrassment and shame and um, all the things that we have to train ourselves um, to cope with. How about when you just want to eat something and you know that it's not, uh, maybe there's a particular risk benefit you're weighing. Um, how, is that a, a, a valid approach as well? When should people be doing that? I think all food decisions are weighing this like risk benefit. And when we think about risk benefit with IBD, we're, we get really stuck on using food for symptom or disease management. And so symptom or food therefore becomes this like medication tool when I can forget that food has a taste experience to it and a social experience to it. That maybe for me, I'm going to weigh the value of the taste and the social aspects to be higher than my symptom or disease management in that particular moment. Um, and we also recognize that uh, symptoms after eating are driven by so much more than just the nutrient itself. In some cases, it is a particular nutrient. Maybe I have a reaction to eating something like dairy or gluten, um, but I may be having symptoms after eating because of what time of day it was or what consistency that food was or how much I ate or my underlying condition, am I in a flare or not? Or I might be having symptoms because the nerves of my digestive tract are overly sensitive. We use the term visceral sensitivity for this, where any food I put in my mouth at that time might cause symptoms or distress for me. And that's not nutrient specific. And then I also have what my body and brain are expecting to happen to it after I eat. And we use the word expectancy there. All of these things shape my experience after eating that may or may not be driven by what I actually put in my body. And so in that case, I'm going to be thinking about a variety of factors as I decide what foods I'm going to put in my body that I may very well enjoy the taste in the social environment. And yes, I could have symptoms on the other side, but can I manage those symptoms if they were to come up? Raman, I'm curious, do you find yourself uh, making decisions like that where you want to eat something and it may not sit as well with you, but you make the choice anyway? How, how do you do it? I think I think over time, I'm, I'm, uh, I've been a little disappointed. And also, I want to mention too, you know, it, it, like shame, guilt, and blame should like, you know, never be part of like the eating process. And, I, I you know, people, you know, are experts on their own lives and, and their own experiences. And clinicians, you know, like Madison can can help you with, you know, tools and expertise to to navigate both, uh, you know, nutritional options as well as like other other aspects of eating. And I think you know the 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 best the, the best uh, cases are when people get get to meet with clinicians who can, um, you know, not look only at their physical state but you know their entire lives, like their motivations, their interests, the resource their resources. And from there, kind of figure out some some options, especially you know in the case of nutrition, maybe it, it's nothing or maybe a little education. It could be some you know all the way to enteral nutrition or even therapeutic diets. So there's a lot of evidence based nutrition options out there, but I think it's really individual and and helping you know having a clinician like help educate you and and do work around that. So I want to mention NT for, uh, nutritional therapy for IBD is doing a lot of work with their medical advisory board to kind of educate both clinicians and patients to sort of bring these best practices, um, just having having them more available to support overall IBD treatment. Thanks, Raman. I wanted to um, 
just understand a bit what your process is when you travel for the holiday time. You had mentioned oh. earlier that you have to prepare for that. Uh, Dr. Simons yeah. advised us all to prepare. Wanted to dig a little deeper on that point because a lot of us will be traveling during the mm -hmm. holiday time or for other occasions, not necessarily the holidays. How yeah. do you personally talk, walk us through how you might prepare for your travel? Uh, well, I, I think a lot of the times I, I think about, you know, in terms of the travel, like where where I'll be when I'm hungry. <laughs> so, you know, if it if it's if it's a plane trip and, you know, depending on the time of day or something, you know, will I be in a car or actually in the air or maybe delayed in an airport terminal? And depending on the trip, I'll pack extra, you know, snacks or foods. And if, if my destination is, is you know, has like is if it's somewhere far away and there's friends and family often. You know, I'll ask, you know, can you have something, can you have something for me if I, if I feel I need it, especially in terms of um, food or, or, or other things. So, yeah, I mean, the, the holidays, I, I, I don't tend to go, you know, beyond like maybe a, a few hours plane flight, but I, I've definitely, you know, been on several trips. I think every other year I'm, I'm on a trip that lasts almost like 24 hours or 18 to 24 hours to, to see my, uh, my partner's family in India. So um, I think just just plan, 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 and and think ahead. Um, Dr. Simons, any tips, specifically little nuggets and tips that we could take away from uh, from you on how to plan for your trips? This is a little bit of like my own personal experience here too, but I remember like early on in my own navigating nutrition, like restrictive diets, I would travel with a cooler like every flight had a cooler and you learn very quickly your like TSA regulations like you can travel with yogurt if you put fruit in it it doesn't register as a it doesn't register as a fluid so you can pack like larger amounts of yogurt if you pack enough stuff into it and you know you're searching for microwaves that airports might have if you've packed food and you want to microwave it and this comes back to some of the practicing um too can I practice what it's like to ask a um, business or a restaurant if I could use their microwave? Sometimes they might say no, but if you never have the practice of asking that question, you might be more inclined to stay home instead of travel when there could be ways to work around this where you could bring your own food and feel more comfortable in an eating experience over time that flexibility develops and I no longer travel with a large cooler anymore. Um, but that's not where many people are at initially in their journey. And so finding ways to vary just one level of risk at a time, I'm willing to do the travel as long as I have my own food and that's okay in the beginning. Um, get your experience of asking for support with that. That, that that's a great uh, great story actually. I, I I also relate to the yogurt story <laughs> from years ago. Like, um, so I think once like someone ahead of me had too much toothpaste, and because of that they overlooked my yogurt. <laughs> I was like, yeah, <laughs> so small wins. Yeah. Uh, Doctor Simons, and um, from a medical standpoint, from your perspective, um, should patients have um, med medical contingencies? talk to their doctors about their travel plan before they make those plans? Is that something you would advise? I know a lot of patients, if they're thinking about traveling a long ways from home, will have a sense of where are the local hospitals for me? What are my alarm symptoms in which I might need to go to a hospital while I'm traveling? And they could have that conversation with their doctor. Like, when is this uncomfortable for me? And I don't like how my body is feeling versus this is now becoming more of an emergent situation and I need to present to an emergency room, something that many people don't want to have to do. And they may ask their doctors for additional medications so that they feel more comfortable in the travel environment. But knowing that they have a loved one that's close by who knows here again, here are my warning signs. This is what I need to be watching for. And this is where I'm going to go. If something were to happen while I'm traveling, I think many pa patients feel reassured by knowing that they'll be able to receive care. Perfect. Thank you. I, I think that's a great tip. Um, Raman, 
Mm -hmm. I wanted to open it up to you to see if you had any questions for Dr. Simons tonight uh, that you are any burning questions you have. Oh, you know, I, I guess one of them would be, you know, I, I, I wish like GI psychology was around, you know, in or much earlier. And, and I was curious, you know, for, for people, you know, I've told some stories from other people and, you know, where, where should people look for support, you know, if, if they want to find someone to sort of practice or, or with the skills that you bring? Depends on where you're located. So the Rome Foundation has a gastro psych directory where people can look up providers who have um, gastro psychology training in their state or in their country. So you can put in your zip code to find licensed providers nearby to you. Not everybody has access to a provider. And so there are some um, mobile apps that people might be able to get this kind of support also. And that's something you could talk with your medical provider about to say, hey, I noticed that my um, symptoms are affecting my mental health or my mental health is affecting my symptoms. What resources do you have or recommendations you have? And then hopefully your provider can, if they don't already know, reach out into their community to get some support for that. Great, thanks. Thank you. Um, well, we are going to wrap up and I just wanted to ask before we do, um, Raman, any last words of advice to the IBD community? Uh, I just want to say, you know, we, we spoke about a lot of, you know, difficult situations over the holidays, but the holidays are also a great time to, you know, reconnect and get some rest and relax. And, and think about, you know, my earlier, you know, experiences, like I was just thinking if you do feel yourself, you know, isolated or frustrated, to definitely make the effort to reach out to a friend, a family member, a clinician, even online support, you know, just, just to remember you're not alone in these experiences. And uh, just want to say we, we, we wish you uh, good health for the holidays and, and of course, afterwards. So. Great, thank you. And Dr. Simons, any advice from you? I think that's a great point that Raman brings up. I think about the function of sadness, like the emotion of sadness. And it's really to draw people closer to us when we feel sad and we even when we cry it elicits helping behaviors from other people around us and our culture has it that crying is something that should be done alone or that it's shameful to cry when really it's our body's way of asking i need more support right now i need social support um and that can look a range of different ways for people but Raman, I just so appreciate that sentiment of you are not alone. Ask for medical support, ask for social support, whatever that might be. Well, thank you so much to both the both of you, Dr. Simons and Raman, uh, for sharing your story and being so candid and open in this conversation this evening. I really appreciate it. And I know our community will find this very helpful um, this, as they approach the holiday season. So I feel like we will all be better equipped to cope with the challenges, at least get some tips and um, support knowing that we're not alone in this process. Uh, well, thank you so much to the both of you. Um, and if anyone has any questions about diet and nutrition and IBD, any additional questions about inflammatory bowel disease, um, please visit the foundation's website at CrohnsColitisFoundation.org, and you can also get information at NutritionalTherapyForIBD.org. Again, contact the Help Center if you have any remaining questions, whether they be about diet or outside of diet and other aspects of the IBD journey. Contact us at 1-888-MY-GUT-PAIN or email us at info at CrohnsColitisFoundation.org. I want to say a special thank you to Nutritional Therapy for IBD for your collaboration in this program. Um, and please tune in, if you've not already, to our video on malnutrition in IBD that should be linked uh, within the description below. We wish everyone a safe and healthy holiday season ahead. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Thanks so much, Kat. Thanks, Madison. Thanks, Kat.